responsive and up this morning. We have some that are still coming in. Others of you that are joining us on the live stream, we're really excited that you have come to, to worship with us this morning. Uh, today's a good day. It's a good day to be together, a good day to worship the Lord. Um, we bring the good, the bad, the ugly of this week, and we come and we just lay it before the Lord, and we say, Lord, here we are. Take our heart and uh, do what you want to do with us, and uh, use us as you, as you please. So uh, today we're going to be uh, a little bit later in our service after, after the message. We're going to take uh, communion together, so this is going to be a special time where we get to gather around as a family, family of believers, uh, reflecting on what Jesus has, has done for us. So um, if you haven't already, this would be a great time if you're on, on the live stream to, to make sure you have your, your communion supplies. If you failed to grab some here in person, um, there's some in the back, so you feel free to go back and, and grab what you need there uh, to be able to be prepared to, to take with us. So it is so good to see you all. And uh, for those of you that are, that are joining, maybe for the first or second time, we're, we're just really glad that you're here. And, uh, and we're, we're excited to be able to, uh, to worship the Lord together. So uh, let's go ahead. We'll go ahead and uh, have our worship team uh, lead us. But before we do that, um, I want to read for us to prepare our heart. I want to read for us out of Psalms 138. It says, I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart before the gods. I will sing your praise. I will bow down towards your holy temple and will praise your name for your unfailing love and your faithfulness. For you have so exalted your solemn decree that it surpasses your fame. When I called, you answered me. You greatly emboldened me. May all the kings of the earth praise you, Lord, when they hear what you have decreed. May they sing of the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. Though the Lord is exalted, he looks kindly on the lowly. Though lofty, he sees them from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes. With your right hand, you save me. The Lord will vindicate me. Your love, Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. This is the word of the Lord, and let's, uh, let's stand and let's respond in worship to our great God this morning. Well, good morning, church. Thank you. All right, I hope you praise and worship better than that, okay?
just want you to be with us as we have come here to praise and worship you, to proclaim you as our King, our Savior. Father, we're hungry for your love today, so we invite you to come down and just be with us. Purify our hearts, purify our thoughts. Let us be pleasing to you as we sing this song, how hungry we are for your love, Jesus. We pray that the words that the pastor bring today are your words. And I pray that we all would just bow down on our knees and listen to your words and take them in. And then we go out and do your work. Father, I pray over this congregation that you would heal, heal every sickness, that you would take away any pain that anyone has suffered from this morning, any doubts, any fears, Father. Please just take those away this morning. I pray for those who are watching this online because they're still our family, Father, and, and I know that... Um, you're in their living rooms with them. Wherever they may be, you are there. So thank you, Jesus. Thank you for being who you are. And we pray all these wonderful things in the name of Jesus. Hungry I come to you for I know you satisfy. I am empty, but I know your love does not run dry. So I'll wait for you. So I'll wait for you. Hungry I come to you, for I know you satisfy. I am empty, but I know your love does not. So I'll wait for you, so I'll wait for you, falling on my knees, offering all of me, Jesus. living for broken I run to you for your arms are open wide I am weary but I know your touch Restores my 
seated. Amen. Um, let's fall on our knees, humbly serving the Lord through prayer right now. Lord, you are so good and gracious to us. We thank you that your grace is extended upon us day in and day out. That as we go through things in this world that brings us to our knees, that breaks us, Lord, that your grace is extended to us. Your love is extended to us. God, we are so grateful that you are a God that pursues us to the ends of the earth. That there's nothing that we can do or say to outrun that love, to outrun that grace, to outrun the constant pursuit of you in our lives. Lord, we thank you that you are a God at work in our lives. You are a living God that the Holy Spirit dwells within us, that you provided, you gave an advocate on our behalf. So we have direct access to you. So when we come and we pray, or we come and we worship, or we come and we read the word of God, that those words come alive, that something is stirring in our hearts, that we crave you. We want more of you. So much so that we are willing to fall on our knees. To humble ourselves. We are willing to humble ourselves today, Lord. 
and say, we need you. We need a savior. We need Jesus. We need the Holy Spirit and we need God the Father. The triune God working as one within our lives. Lord, continue to work in our lives as we go out from this building, as we go out from this place. Just like you pursue us, let us have that love to pursue others, to bring them in, to welcome them into this family. Lord, you have given us a family. You have given us people in our lives who love us, who encourage us, who challenge us. Lord, we're thankful for this family you have adopted us into. We thank you for the Spirit's presence in our hearts, dwelling within us, guiding us, correcting us, convicting us, Lord, we're not perfect, and yet you are. And so we can fall on our knees, obedient to what you have for us. Lord, I pray over Pastor Steve's message today. That it inspires us. It uplifts our spirits. It encourages us. It draws us to you. Lord, we are so thankful for you. We love you with our whole mind, our whole bodies, our whole souls, and our whole hearts. Lord, we give you our worship. We give you our time. We come to you on our knees, allowing you to restore us. And Lord, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Well, if you are a kid, preschool to first grade, I believe, we are going to dismiss the kids. And I see some friends going back there already. Everybody else, second graders and above, ooh, that was loud, um, you got to stay in here with us. So we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to learn a lot of things. Yeah. Who's ready? Awesome. Let's go. We're ready for Pastor Steve to get up here. Give us the message today. Okay. Thank you, Crystal. Um, we're going to be looking at the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8. If you want to go ahead and get that in front of you in just, just a minute. I did want to say thank you for those of you. A lot of you have told me you've, been, you've prayed for me. I, I had a little bout with COVID um, last last week and the week before, um, kind of just a bad cold, wasn't, wasn't terrible, but um, thanks, I could, I could feel the prayers for our family and uh, during, during my sickness, so thanks, thanks a lot. As Pastor Kevin mentioned, we are going to take communion uh, at the end of the message this morning, so um, if, you, if you're at home and you, you know, grab some juice and some bread, or if you didn't get your, if you're here and you didn't get your um, little cup and wafer. This is a great time to do that right now. Feel free. Just get up. It's all right. We realize um, maybe you didn't remember that. You, you don't have to be a member of our church to take communion. Just have placed your uh, faith in, in Jesus. And um, so um, we're grateful. It's a little warmer in here today, right? So we're, we're grateful for that. And I just want to say thank you. Like, if you Joe right there. Kind of wave at us, Joe. He's right there. Yeah, just keep your hand up so people can hear. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, um, we we got the part in this week in Joe, and uh, Blaine Brown have just spent hours um, getting parts and putting in parts and climbing up on the building. And so thank you so much that um, it's almost completely fixed. <laughs> We're in a good place. 
Um, okay, so we have been, if you go back a few weeks, this is actually the third message that we've had on the book of Nehemiah, okay? So it's been a while, so I thought I wanted to take just a little bit of time for some review this morning. We've been talking about rebuilding our broken walls, and that's kind of the theme of the book of Nehemiah, and it seems like it's a theme that fits with where we find ourselves uh, be, these days. We have been facing the reality that there's a lot of stuff broken in our world today. There's stuff broken in our lives. Um, throughout our churches, there's broken stuff in our nation, a lot of brokenness in, in, in our world. And together, we've been praying for God's healing and God's forgiveness and God's grace and a fresh moving of, of His Spirit in our, in our lives, in our church, in our nation, in our world. I'm glad, aren't you, that every Sunday we come together to affirm that our God is a healing, saving, forgiving God of resurrection. Aren't you glad? Yeah. That's, all, that's our story, that, he, that we serve the God of new life, and He births new things. Well, um, let's review briefly, okay? So here's a little history here. You can't really understand the book of Nehemiah unless you kind of get into a little bit of the background and history of the, the Old Testament. So the book of Nehemiah takes place in a period of time around 485 B.C., and it's the period of time after following what's called the exile. The exile was a pivotal event in um, in the, in, in the Bible. Um, the exile begins when the armies of Nebuchadnezzar come and basically obliterate the city of Jerusalem and the land of Judah. The prophets of God had been calling his people back to a true love for him for hundreds of years, but yet they continued to worship idols and follow other priorities in their lives and forget God. And so finally, God uses the army of Nebuchadnezzar, and he crushes the holy city of Jerusalem, kind of this beacon on a hill. It's the center of their worship. The temple is destroyed where they offered sacrifices. The walls of the city are left in rubble. The people are killed. They're driven from their homes. They're taken captive and shipped off to the land of Babylon. And for the most part, Jerusalem is left, with the exception of a few people, a ghost town. So um, that's 587 B.C. It's 70 years of the exile, and there's like a new ruler in town. There's this guy named Cyrus, and he's the Persian king, and in 538 B.C., he says to the Israelite people, all right, you can go home now. You can go back. You can head on back to your homeland. And so they do. They they, they kind of gravitate back little by little. They, they trickle back, and they find this destroyed center of their worship life. Their, their, their holy city, Jer Jerusalem, is just, just gone. Um, there was a spiritual leader that God used named Ezra. It's like the book right before Nehemiah. And under his leadership, the temple was rebuilt. So the worship life of Israel was restored. Then Nehemiah comes into the picture. And Nehemiah, we said, was a cupbearer, a trusted advisor, the one who tasted the food of the king to make sure it wasn't poisoned. The life of the king was in his hands. And uh, he, so he first served this foreign king, Artaxerxes. And um, word comes to him, he's an Israelite, word, word, word comes to him that the walls of Jerusalem are, are broken down that they lay in rubble. So there's no security for the city. They're prone to foreign invasion. There's no safety. The, the, the city can't be what it was meant to be with the walls broken down. So he enters into this time of prayer and fasting, of confession, seeking God's direction. Finally, he courageously goes in at the risk of his life. He asks the king for permission to go and rebuild, lead in the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. I hope you'll read the story. It's like 13 chapters. It's not a long, it's not a long book, and you can kind of get you can kind of get all of this. Um, 
So he goes in, the king grants him favor, says, okay, yeah, you can take some lumber, you can take some soldiers to protect you, I'll give you a letter so you can go safely to the land of, of uh, Jerusalem, your homeland. And so he travels there, and he goes out, and in the middle of the night, he, he uh, kind of surveys the broken walls, and then the next day, he gathers the people together, and he says, he lays out a vision. He says, God's put on my heart to for us to rebuild these walls, and I have the king's permission, and I've got these supplies and these materials, and um, the people say, well, yeah, let's do it. You know, let's get busy. Let's rebuild the walls. Let's, let's do what God has called you here to help us to do. And so he divides up, like, the walls in different sections, and each family has a section, and with the exception of a few lazy people who are contrary, like, and just sit on the sidelines, everybody gets to work, and in 52 days, the walls are built. It's just an amazing, amazing thing. And the, these are, it's, it's like a six-foot-wide wall, okay? So this isn't like a small project. I mean, this is big, secure walls. And so we've kind of used that as just, just kind of a review. We've used that to say, you know, this is kind of where we are. There's some, some walls that are broken down. Um, and so we... Like Nehemiah, you know, we, we went in, we entered into 21 days of prayer and fasting. It's just, we need some healing of brokenness. We, we need God to do a fresh new thing. And so was, there was time of prayer and fasting, and a part of that was confession of our, our sins and failures as individuals, as a church, as, as a nation. And so then we kind of were in this time of, okay, God, what, how are you leading us? What are the new directions that you have for us? And Two weeks ago, we talked about recommitting to our vision. We talked about what's the vision, what's the mission of our, of our church. And I'd just like to remind us of, of that, that our church vision, what we're about is like connecting people to God. I mean, we want people to know God and, and, and staying connected to each other. And then, but then not just, not just what happens here, but then going out and transforming our community and our world. And we talked about the priorities that we're, we're committed to, our, our sense of mission, what Jesus called us to. And so our, our, there's five priorities that we're, we're called to, that we believe in as a church, and that's discipleship, that we're growing, we're vibrant in our, our walk with Christ, and, that, and evangelism, that we're not, just, we're not just growing, but we're also sharing our faith, that we're praying for people who need to know Jesus Worship what we did this morning, expressing our love to God as we gather to, to worship Him, but also in our daily lives, being people who worship Him with our lives. Ministry is getting busy, rolling up our sleeves and serving, serving and teaching classes and um, being a part of His work in the church. And then fellowship is our spiritual friendship together. We know that as we go about these, we'll face opposition, right? Right? If we're doing this stuff... We have an enemy. He's not going to be happy about that. We're going to encounter opposition. The personal power of evil is running rampant in our world. But we, we do this work in the courage of our almighty God that we've been singing about this morning. We know that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world, right? So we don't cower in fear. We approach this mission with a sense of, with a sense of urgency. And we're ready, like the people of Nehemiah's day, to divide up the work, everybody doing their part, and rebuilding the broken walls with the help of God's Spirit. So we might be tempted to think as we think about the story of Nehemiah, well, okay, the walls are built. 52 days, the work is done. But as we read through it, that's just like about the halfway point in the book, if you, if you read through it, because um, there's some other things that need to happen. And it's basically two things that you see need to happen. Well, one is there still weren't very many people in the city. They had the walls, but not too many people. So they said, we got to get, we, we want our city, our capital, our center of our worship, we want it to be vibrant and alive. And so Nehemiah challenged the people. He said, let's, they were living in the suburbs. <laughs> he said, like, one family out of every 10 needs to move back into the city. So they did. It's like they, they cooperated, and some of them actually, they moved back into these empty homes. They restarted the businesses, 
and, and created a new vibrancy. So that, that was one thing that needed to happen. But we want to really focus on the second one, and that was that the people needed revival. There needed to be a spiritual renewal. And so this Sunday next Sunday, we're going to focus on the steps that Nehemiah took in leading the people and seeing revival come to their land. So that's kind of where we want to jump in, Nehemiah chapter 8. And let's stand together this morning as we, we look at the Word. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were under, able to understand. So that, I think that means like the, the preteens were there, the teens were there, um, you know, maybe the grade school kids were there. Anybody could understand. You know, they all came together. He read it. From daybreak till noon, as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra, the teacher of the law, stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him on his right stood a bunch of guys who were leaders in the community. <laughs> I'm just going to skip. <laughs> I'm going to skip over those. <laughs> Ezra opened the book, and the people could see him because he was standing above them, and he opened it, and the people all stood. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces on the ground. Um, the Levites, a bunch of them, we're going to skip those as well, instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. Then Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priest and teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people have been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and Send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to the Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. But the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. And all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food, and to celebrate with great joy, because they had understood the words that had been made known to them. On the second day of the month, the heads of all the families, along with the priests and the Levites, gathered around Ezra, the teacher, to give attention to the words of the law. All right, you may be seated. So the first thing that Nehemiah does after the walls are all completed is he builds this huge platform. Big high platform. I don't know how tall it was, but it was big enough to hold at least 15 men. Those are the names, I, the names of the guys I skipped over. When that was completed, he, he called a meeting of all the people of the city, men, women, teens, older children, all who were able to understand. Now, on the first day of the new month, as the sun is beginning to come up over the horizon, they're all there in the town square, all the people of the town. And Ezra, the old priest, has a book in his arms, and he climbs up the stairs of the platform, followed by the leaders of the community. And he opens his book. It's the book of the law of Moses. And he begins to read. This is like first thing in the morning. And it says he reads till noon. <laughs> that was a long church service, huh? <laughs> I mean, hour after hour after hour after hour. And as he reads, we're told that throughout the crowd, there's like the muffled sound of, sounds of people crying. They realize they haven't been obeying what they're hearing. And conviction falls upon them. Weeping tears of repentance because they've been living in disobedience to the Scripture. 
five hours. Finally, the old priest closes up the book. It's noontime now. Turns around. Walks down the stairs. The people are on their faces before God, weeping. And what happens the next day? Next day, Ezra climbs the stairs again, opens the book, reads for hours. Sometimes the Levites, the priests of the city, gather like circles of people around and say, this is what it means. This is what he's talking about. This is what the Scripture tells us we should do. So with, with that background, I want to I want to give us kind of the first key to revival. It's very simple, but it's still clear here in this passage. And it's simply recommit to learning and obeying God's Word. Recommit to learning and obeying God's Word. The people had neglected God's Word. Does that sound familiar when you think about America today? People neglected God, God's Word during the years of the exile. There was no public worship of God. The Scriptures had become dust collectors. Most people couldn't read, but they weren't in a place where they could hear God's Word speaking to them. It sat on the shelf. And God's priorities for the way people should live went by the wayside. And so in Nehemiah's time, this revival begins by, and it wasn't just one day and then two days, but it says every single day of the month, the people gathered together in the square of the city outside the temple, all the people, and hour after hour after hour, they listened to the reading of God's law, God's word. Spiritually attentive. So as we kind of begin this idea of revival, I would just kind of like to say, how about you? How about you? Are you learning? Are you reading? Are you obeying the Bible? Or it, it outlines God's priorities for the way that we should live our lives. And we neglect it to our own danger. The Bible is our spiritual nourishment, and without, without a de regular diet of reading it, our spiritual lives become weak and anemic. Now, I just want to say the Bible is not necessarily an easy book to understand, and so that's why we have like Bible study groups, and, and, and you're here because you want to learn, right? That's why you're here, so thank you for being here today. There's one thing I wanted to just kind of recommend to you, um, those of you who have smartphones. Like, this is like a really great app. You probably already have it. But um, if you don't have this, you should get this on your phone uh, because it's got, like, um, Bible studies, daily Bible studies, like, for students, grandparents, leaders, help strengthen your marriage, like, dating, friendships, like, just a just an excellent excellent app to kind of get you plugged in to the scriptures. Okay, so but there are three. I want to move on. There are three very specific areas as we read through the book of Nehemiah where the people had strayed from God's law, um, and if they were to experience revival, they need to obey God's word in these three specific areas. So I, I want to. I want to kind of draw those out for us this morning. The first one is to put God first in your relationships. To put God first in your relationships. So one of the things that we see, and here we're going to jump over to Nehemiah chapter 10. One of the areas that had drawn the Israelites away from God over the centuries is that they had married people of other cultures and nations. So in Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 30, it says, the people made a solemn promise to God. We promise not to give our daughters in marriage to the people around us or take their daughters for our sons. Now, this wasn't forbidding interracial marriages. What happened was that there would be like, say, a young Israelite man, and he would take a wife from one of the other 
nations or cultures around them. And, and let's say and this, she would bring her gods, her idols, household idols into the house. And so it became a point of spiritual compromise. Okay? Instead of, well, I'm using man. It could be the, opposite, could be the other way around. Um, instead of that man loving God, the true God, foreign idols were brought into the house. And there was spiritual compromise. And it was based on relationships that were not according to God's plan. And the young man in this case would be drawn away from a pure, sincere devotion to God. And so here, the people are being called back by the reading of the Scriptures so that they're not engaged in relationships that will pull them away from their love and devotion to God. It's the truth that the friendships we engage in and the relationships that we keep, particularly the closest ones, can easily pull us away from the devotion to Jesus that we desire. So there's a scripture. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common, or what fellowship can light have with darkness? Okay. So when it says yoke, don't be yoked together, that's not talking about an egg yoke. It's talking about a yoke that connects animals together. It's the wood stuff on top of the oxen. Yoke together, be connected at the neck. If we're connected in an intimate way, close friendship, we can be pulled away from our love for Jesus. Now, I have to be kind of careful here. Because Jesus is described as a friend of sinners, right? <laughs> he has spent his time with tax collectors and sinners like, quote, undesirable people. They were close, his closest friends and became his followers. And one of the most effective ways that we can become true witnesses for Christ is to have like three or four friends that we're praying for, that we're spending time with, that we're seeking to witness to. That's an important part of our responsibility. But Jesus was strong and mature in his faith so that through his friendship with these people, they were drawn to open their hearts to God. And they became committed to following him and serving with him. They never dragged Jesus away from his love for God. But we're not Jesus, are we? So we have to kind of be on our guard in this regard. The principle of not being yoked together with unbelievers means it's, not, it's unwise to date an unbeliever because you're building your lives on different foundations. You, as a follower of Christ, you're seeking to follow him with all of your heart, but he or she has, the person you're in that, involved in the relationship with has other priorities than following Jesus. So that complete unity will be missing because at the core of your heart is Jesus, but Jesus is not the priority of the person you love. Okay, we're going to take a little, uh, take a little pause here. I'm going to invite the kids to come down. Come on down here, guys. You guys are sitting so nice. Thank you, bud. Wake up. You can fall asleep. <laughs> come on down. Have a seat. Have some kids here today. The little ones are downstairs, but have a seat. This is kind of for all of us. I don't know. Can you see these glasses here? I think you can see them, right? All right. So just a little um, object lesson for us today. So we're going to pretend that this is you. You're the blue person. We're going to show you around a little bit. Yeah. You can see you're impressed by this, huh, Finney? Okay. <laughs> and then this is your friend. This is you. This is your friend. And this is a friend that we're going to say loves Jesus like you do. Okay. 
This friend loves Jesus like you do. And when you're together with your friend who loves Jesus, what do you think happens when we when the mix these together? Hmm, let's see. Let's turn these right. Turn blue. Colors yellow. You're right, Finny. It made a new color, didn't it? Okay. So that's kind of our way of thinking about, well, when we have a friend that loves Jesus and we come together as friends, like there's something beautiful. We get a, like a brand new color. It's a good thing. Now, let's come over here. And again, we're going to make here the blue person. I don't know. You can think about this. Most of us can kind of think about this. So. And then this is sort of, I don't know, this is kind of yellowish. This is, this is oil. So we're going to make this you. We're going to make this like a friend that you might have. That maybe, I don't know, they don't love Jesus. Like maybe, I don't know, they say words Jesus doesn't like. They do things that are mean. I don't know, maybe you know somebody like that. You don't have to say their name. So what do you think happens when we mix you with your friend that doesn't love Jesus? Okay, and then we say it's going to be one of the... Let's see what happens. Charcoal colors that kind of color goes. And let's just see if we stir it up. What's happening? Stir it up. Maybe can we get green here? Somebody, I think, said what Antonio I think said what would happen. They don't mix, do they? They don't mix because if our friends don't love Jesus and we do. We can't mix and have something have something beautiful together. So we we try to. We try to love our friends that don't know Jesus. But the friends that we really connect with, the ones who do love Jesus, who help us. Because sometimes these people can pull us away from Jesus, right? When we kind of start doing things that are not right, the things that God is not pleased with. So we have to be careful that we choose our friends wisely. Okay, that's it. Thank you for coming up. Yeah. All right. What is Bill, Bill Nye the science guy or whatever? I don't know. <laughs> so maybe this challenges us today to, are there friendships in your life that pull you away from your commitment to follow Jesus with all your heart? God may be calling you to put him first in all of your relationships. Does this relationship pull me away from loving and serving Jesus with all my heart and mind and strength? Or does this person support and enhance my desire to follow Jesus? Are you on the same page when it comes to your desire to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? So the first area that God wants us to get right is to put God first in our relationships. All right, so um, the second thing, another key area that's mentioned here in chapter uh, Nehemiah 10, verse 31. It says, when the neighboring people bring merchandise or grain to sell on the Sabbath, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or any holy day. Every seventh year, we will forego work in the land and we'll cancel all debts. Don't take this and say, put God first in your work and your use of time. And this is like the principle of the Sabbath, the principle of the Sabbath. We know that God built into the very fiber of the universe the truth that we human beings were not meant 
to work, 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 all the time. We know that God created this beautiful world. It's a beautiful world, isn't it? I mean, beautiful sunsets. Like, you know, even the snow is pretty, right? <laughs> Rather not have it, but it's pretty. <laughs> Just a beautiful world that God made. And our story is that in, in Genesis is that six days. God created the world. He made this beautiful planet with bubbling brooks and beautiful mountains and bugs and animals. And the sixth day, he made Adam and Eve, and he stood back and he said, Whoa, I did good. Right? Kind of pat himself on. That's good. I'm, I did good work. Okay, if you do good work, you should, should be proud of that. Now, as a parenthesis, I just want to say that, you know, when we look at the creation account, God created in six days, there's always a question, of, well, was it the literal 24-hour period, or was it just referring to a period of time? Well, we don't really have time to answer that question, but uh, but I think it's kind of answered in 2 Peter 3.8. It says, do not forget this one thing with the uh, the Lord. A day is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like a day. God's time is different than ours, right? But on the seventh day of creation, which is our point today, God rested. And this is called the Sabbath. It's a day of rest and renewal. It's one of the big ten, right? One of the big ten commandments. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. It's a day of rest, restoration, play. The Israelites had neglected it. It had become like any other day, a day of business as usual. Does that sound familiar? You know, where the mall is going to be booming today, right? Business as usual. Keeping the Sabbath means putting God first in your work, in your use of time, keeping your life in balance by picking a day for rest and renewal and worship. Sabbath affirms the truth that you're more than what you do. You're more than your work. If you're a job, if you're, if you're on your job or as a student, you're more than that. Now, I don't want to get into the specifics of what you should or shouldn't do on the Sabbath, for most of you, it's Sunday. For me, no, it's not Sunday. <laughs> Sunday's a busy day for me. So Monday is my Sabbath. Pastor Kevin, Ashley, Thursday. So if you call me on a Monday or call them on a Thursday, we might not get back to you right away because we're doing what the Bible says we should do. And that's taking a Sabbath, which you should do as well. Your Sabbath, the principle of Sabbath is that you're, if you're obeying the Bible in this regard, is that it, it should renew you. It should be restful. It should be fun. My daughter's family, we visit them. Uh, on Sunday morning, they eat bacon and peanut butter pancakes lathered with fruit and whipped cream and syrup, of course. It's like a special breakfast that they kind of started off with. But I don't know, eat ice cream. If you like football, if that's restful to you, watch football, take a hike or a walk, read a good book, take a nap, drink coffee. If you're married, make love, go to the playground, call or hang out with a friend. Yes, I said that. You practice the renewing rest of Sabbath. And that helps the rest of your life fall into place. It affirms that you're more than your work productivity. So there's two things in your life that will tell the story about whether or not your, your love and devotion is genuine. We're talking about revival. We're talking about renewal, priority. Your time, your calendar. I can see your calendar. So use your time in a way that honors God. Let me look at your schedule. Where do you carve out time for God in your day? in your week. And then, of course, the other thing, 
And this is the other thing. It's like, I, I'm not sure I would have done these, these particular ones, but he, he, the other thing is like your checkbook or your online banking record. How do you spend your money? And, and that's actually the final area of challenge because it's where the rubber meets the road. And that is put God first in your finances. And this is the principle of the tithe. So this is chapter 10, verse 35. We also assume responsibility for bringing to the house of the Lord each year, the first fruits of our crops, of every fruit tree. As it is also written in the law, we bring our firstborn sons, our cattle, our herds, our flocks to the house of our God, to the priests ministering there. Moreover, we will bring to the storerooms of the house of our God, to the priests, first of our ground meal, our grain offerings, of the fruit of our trees, and of new wine and oil. We will bring a tithe of our crops to the Levites, for it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all the towns where we work. So tithing, if you don't know what it is, it means simply one-tenth. Giving one-tenth of what God has given to you to the place where you receive your spiritual nurture and where you engage in his mission to the world. It's not a tax. Throughout the, God, throughout the scripture, God calls us to honor him with our money, with this first tenth. We live in a world that's all about how much do I get? Getting, getting, getting. But this is countercultural because we start by taking the first tenth and say, okay, God, I'm giving this to you. And so we give. I give. Like every Sunday, my first tenth. In fact, in one, one book in the Bible, Malachi chapter 3, God said, why are you robbing me? And they said, what do you mean we're robbing you? And he answered, in tithes and offerings, you're under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that they may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Now, this isn't like a give to get rich. There's a lot of other ways that God blesses us. It doesn't mean if you tithe, you're going to get rich. But one of the keys to revival is honoring God in every area of our lives. And this is God's plan. They brought the tithe into the temple. It supported the, the priests, but it also provided for the poor. And it's still God's plan for supporting his mission to the church. Key to revival. So three things that we've been talking about today, honor God's word in our relationships, honor God's word in our work and time by keeping Sabbath, and honor God in our finances. I was thinking that eight years ago, this past fall, we started construction on this building that we're sitting in. And uh, I looked up some pictures in January they started digging these trenches in the ground, and I never really knew this, but they're called footers. I didn't know what a footer was, but now I know what a footer is. That's like the trench that's in the ground, and you can't see it real well in the picture, but that's filled with cement and rebar. They dig the ground. You want to make sure that there's a solid foundation. And then, and then I watched as like... They started building up. So go ahead to the next picture. Yeah, it's kind of, it starts going up. And the next one, yeah, we put the walls in, and now they're laying the hollow core, I think I learned it's called. And, and I was thinking that our learning to obey and honor God's word, it's like the footers of our lives. And we dig, dig deeply into his words, and then we live them out. This is exactly the, what Jesus challenged us to do in his Sermon on the Mount. He gave his teaching, and then he kind of closed with this, with this idea, this picture. You can go ahead and get that, picture, that next picture up. He said, storms of life are going to come, and the wind's going to blow. 
And when the storms come, pandemics come, problems come, brokenness comes to our world, it'll be a test as to who you built your life on and whether or not you've been obeying my words. And the houses of some lives, Jesus said, are going to be like a house here on the left that was built on a solid rock. Trouble comes, storms come. Did you obey my words? But then the house, some other houses are going to be like a house built on, on sand, and the storm came, and the wind, and the waves, and the pandemic, and the problems, and the brokenness, and, and it fell apart. And so the appeal with this, Jesus' appeal, is build your life on obedience to my word. Live Jesus' way. Pastor Kevin's going to come and lead us in taking communion this morning. All right. Can everybody hear me? Okay, we might have to turn this up a little. Nope. Does that work? Okay. Well, normally when we uh, when we gather around this table, it's nice and neat, right? It's uh, sometimes there might be some bread or a, a cup there. Maybe other times we have, uh, maybe it's crown of thorns or maybe it's some nails to remind us of what Jesus did. But when I see this table, as messy as it is right now, it's honestly more fitting to me in, in my table at home. Uh, I, I like to have a clean table, but many times with little kids around, we, we have a little mess on the table. But I think it's actually kind of kind of fitting this morning to to remind to remind us that um, we are messy people, <laughs> and messy people, all messy people, are invited to come to this to this table where Jesus is the one who cleans us up. Jesus is the one that reminds us that I died for you while you were still a sinner, and so that's what we're gathering around the table today with. All right, and so no matter. What you've done, no matter, um, no matter what what has happened this week or happened in your life, this invitation is for you. That Jesus has died for you. Jesus has risen for you, and that is what we what we celebrate today. And so, uh, it's really important that we that we take time to be able to reflect and to prepare our hearts. Um, and so we wanna we wanna be able to do that. And today to help prepare us uh, for this time of communion together, uh, we want to be able to uh, just pray together. And uh, I thought it would be fitting that we would pray the Lord's Prayer today, the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. And so um, if you want to just join me in praying this out loud together today, um, if you're at home as well, the words are up on the screen and up on, on, on your screen at home as well. So uh, let's, just, let's just pray this together, and let's not just say this out of ritual but let's pray this from the depths of our heart and pray as Jesus would ask us to pray. And so let's pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I do need that. Thank you, Mindy. <laughs> All right. So let's grab our, our communion elements. And um, we're reminded now that on the night that our Lord Jesus was betrayed. He took, he took the bread that was on the table and he blessed it. And after he blessed it, he took it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is being broken and being given for you. Whenever you take this, 
take this and eat this bread and be reminded of what I'm going to do for you and what we know now that Jesus did for all of us when he gave his body, he gave his life for us that we could find ours. So let's now take the bread and be thankful for his sacrifice. And likewise, after the supper was finished, he, he took the cup and he gave thanks for he began to pass it around and he said, take and drink from this cup. This wine is the cup of my new covenant. This blood, my blood that's going to be shed for the forgiveness of your sins. And so we're reminded that as we take and as we drink from this, that we're reminded that it's his blood that washes over the multitude of our sins and purifies us and washes us as new and as clean and as white as snow. And so let's take and let's drink and let's be thankful for Jesus' sacrifice for us. Let's pray again. Father, we are just so grateful for your sacrifice, God, for your life that you willingly laid down and gave for us. And Lord, I have to com commit and confess to you right now, Lord, that, God, my life looks many times like this table does, messy, broken. God, I, I have done things, I've said things that I regret. I, I know that they have gone against you. Lord, I know that I try so hard, but oftentimes I fall short of what you ask for. So, Lord, I humbly and we humbly come to this table now, knowing that we are all sinners, that we are messy, that we are broken people. And we confess to you, Lord, that we need you. And, Lord, we confess to you right now that we believe in you. Lord, we believe in your life. We believe that you are the Son of God. We believe that you came and that you died on the cross for us, and you said, it is finished. And when you said it is finished, it meant that you died and you took our sin, you took the weight of our messiness upon your shoulders and you said, I am covering this for you, for all of us who would just simply believe. And so, Lord, we come and we've gathered and we've um, partaken in this, your Lord's Supper. And we're reminded and we're declaring now, Lord, that you are our God. You are our Lord. You are our Savior. And Lord, we need you. And so, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come and that you would purify our hearts, that you would set us right again, Lord, that you would remind us that you are for us and you are not against us, to remind us that we are perfect and blameless in your sight because of you, not because of us, not because of anything we've done. God, we could never earn your grace. But, Lord, we are so grateful that you have willingly and freely given us your grace and your mercy and your love, and your forgiveness. And so, Lord, we receive that today. And we ask that you would help us to live as your people now, to go out and to love those around us. Father, we thank you for your goodness, for your righteousness, for your holiness, God. And we thank you for the work that you're doing in our lives. So, Lord, come, continue to work in us as we respond to you in uh, another song, God. May we... Uh, just be for your service, God, and may you continue to fill us up with your Holy Spirit because we need you each and every day. We love you, Father, and we say thank you for first loving us. We pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Amen. I invite you, let's stand and let's sing another song. If the altar's where you meet us, Take me there, take me there. What you need is just an offering. It's right here, my life is here, and now be a living sacrifice for you. You're a fire, the refiner. I want to be consumed 
I want to be tried by fire, purified. You take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. I want to be tried by fire, purified. You take whatever you Lord, here's my life. If your glory wants to come here, let it fall. We want it all. Your fire is consuming. Fill this place, set it ablaze, and now be a living sacrifice. For you, you're a fire, the refiner. I want to be consumed. I want to be tried by fire. Purified, you take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. I want to be tried by fire, purified, you take whatever you desire, Lord is my life, clean my hands, purify my heart. I want to burn for you, only for you. Take my life as a sacrifice. I want to burn for you, only for you. Oh, clean my I want to be consumed. You're a fire, a refiner. I want to be consumed. I want to be tried by fire. Purify. You take whatever you desire. Lord is my life. I want to be tried by fire, purified, you take whatever you desire, Lord is my life. Maybe see seated. Amen. Thank you, worship team, for leading us. I want to say thank you. Yeah, give it up. Give it up for our worship team. I also want to give a shout out to all those in the back who constantly show up and serve and make it possible for our live stream, for our worship, and for our sound. So thank you for that. Um, it's been, been a great time to, to worship together. Uh, we have just a few quick announcements here for you. Um, so if you have your announcement sheet, I uh, want to direct you to that. I'm not going to go over all of these because there are, are a lot of them, and a lot of them we've already talked about before. But please look this over. Make sure you're familiar with it so you know what's going on in the life of our church. Uh, for those of you who are joining on live stream, we also send this out every Friday uh, in an email. So um, if you're not getting that and would like that, 
please let us know, and we'll, we'll be sure to get you on there. Um, one thing I want to highlight uh, on our announcements is our Foundations of Faith class. So this is, uh, this is an opportunity for uh, anyone who wants to become a member of our church or who wants to learn more about what our beliefs are and um, as a church, but also as um, the Nazarene uh, denomination. If you have any questions, this is a, this is a great opportunity to, to learn more about that and to ask questions and um, this is open up for, for those who maybe even a team might want to join us to, to all ages. So um, we're going to have, this is going to be held after um, our services for four Sundays beginning February 20th, which will take us through March 13th. And it's going to be again 11 a.m. and it's going to be right out here in our, in our foyer. Pastor Steve is going to lead that. So if you are interested and want to know more about that, I know some of you have already talked to us about it. So um, just let us know if you're interested in that, and we'll make sure um, that you have a booklet and everything that you need for that. All of our ladies out here, uh, you guys are invited to join in for a ladies' tea. That's going to be on Saturday, February 26th at 11 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall. And so um, if you are interested in that, um, there's also a little pink insert, a little flyer um, that you can fill out, or you can simply just reach out to Karen Yoder, let her know that you are going to be there, and we, we encourage you, all ages, all ladies, um, come on out, be a part of this, a great time of, of fellowship together. Uh, we also have a men's conference that's coming up, Ignite Men's Impact Weekend. Uh, it's going to be uh, March 11th through 12th in Lynchburg, Virginia, so I know several Several men here are already signed up for that, and uh, there's room for more, and we would love everyone to be a part of that. It's going to be a great, great opportunity to, to grow in our faith and our, in our leadership, and um, it, uh, if you are interested in that, there's a whole bunch of uh, really great names out there that I, I'm excited to hear from, um, but if you're interested in learning more or to register, um, you just go to www.ignitemen.net and make sure you sign up there, and then let either me or uh, Tim Clip know um, that you are interested in going on that so we can make arrangements for hotel and transportation and all that. But that will be um, a great time together. And last but not least, um, we've been talking about Operation Christmas Child, and, uh, and we've uh, obviously come out of a season uh, where we just celebrated Christmas, and you're like, why are we talking about Christmas again? Well, this year we're deciding to go about it a little bit differently in getting our donations, and instead of asking for all the donations all at once, we're now uh, going to break it up by month. And so this month we are looking for coloring books and crayons. So to be exact, we're looking for 126 coloring books, 29 boxes of preschool crayons, and 19 boxes of regular crayons. And so if you can bring some, I know some of you have already brought some because I see that our, our, uh, our box out in the foyer is already filling up, and that's great. Please uh, bring, bring some if you uh, are able to, and we would love to make a difference because, again, this all goes to be a blessing to a lot of kids in, in, in the world who otherwise would not get this and to be able to hear the gospel. So this is a way that we can, as a church, step up to make a difference in our world. So thank you for those who've already been a part and those who will will give um, again. So again, there's a lot more in here. Please check that out. But again, we're just so so grateful that you joined us for worship. And uh, if you guys need anything at all, please reach out to us. We're here for you. We love you. Um, we are a church family, and families do it in the good and the messy and the broken. So reach out. Um, we love you, and we hope that you guys have a great week. All right? God bless you all. You are dismissed. Purify, you take whatever you desire, the Lord is my life.